Well, the reason why I'm here and I dare stand in front of you today is because I simply love Jesus. And I want to tell you the story of how God changed my life for the better. And I also want to tell you a story about how RZIM was instrumental to that change and um, how, um, how our mighty God, our Grand Weaver, orchestrated everything decades before so that I could also play a role in the story of your beloved pastor, Tom Randall. So um, <clears throat> I guess the best way to start is by telling you who I was before I met Christ. <clears throat> I was about... Um, I was about eight or nine or ten years old when, when something happened to me in the past that, uh, that completely separated the boy I was from the man I really wanted to be. It's something that uh, parents here wouldn't want your children to go through. I was, um, I was molested by a man several times when I was a kid. Um, I don't exactly know how I was able to cope uh, with, with that emotion, physical abuse, but I do remember thinking to myself that that some, I lost something that was really essential to my being human. And I made two conclusions from that experience. One was that there's no more point trying to live a good and righteous life because I'm, I'm scarred and it's irreversible. The second conclusion I made was that I will never tell anyone about what happened to me, the disgusting thing that happened to me. And as long as nobody knows, I'll be fine. I learned that people cannot be trusted, so I cannot tell anyone. But the problem was I also learned, or started to think, that I could actually do anything, even if I know it's bad or evil, but as long as nobody knows, I'll be okay. And that was gonna have a catastrophic effect in my life later on. So that molestation experience became the major thing that defined who I was and it controlled, kind of controlled everything that I thought, the way I felt, and the way I acted. So from that, from that experience, as, as I matured, I began to think this, this, there's no God, it's impossible. And if there's a God, it's impossible that He is a loving God, there's no way. Because He allowed this to happen to me. I thought, in, I was sent to a Christian school and we were taught that God is a loving God, but I, I couldn't believe it. He allowed this to happen to me and I can't love someone I cannot trust. And so, so I felt that uh, if he didn't care about me, then why would I care about him? And I thought also that uh, life would be much happier, much enjoyable, more enjoyable if there was no God to tell me what I could or could not do. But the problem was, I still wanted to look good. And I wanted to look like a very good Christian gentleman. So when I was in high school, I actually used to lead prison worship in the morning devotion fellowship. I would do that every day. But I, the problem was I didn't really believe in God anymore. I just enjoyed the company of the people there. They were good Christians. So I was very polite, always gentle, always respectful. I made sure that I did my homework all the time so I could be an honor student. I, uh, when I got to college, I played in the basketball varsity team and uh, I became a ramp model. I was doing uh, international modeling in, in Singapore and Korea and Japan. And in 2005, I, I was finally able to, to uh, follow the footsteps of my dad, who was a doctor. I got my medical degree. And then um, I became the president of the Interns Association in one of the most prestigious hospitals in the Philippines. But uh, after that, I was, uh, I was about 2006, five, 2005, so I pursued my, my training in anti-aging medicine uh, in Paris because I wanted to be the, number, the first in the Philippines. There were, at that time, there were no anti-aging specialists in the Philippines. But I got, before I could take the boards, I got sidetracked um, to... Uh, a faster way to fame and, for, uh, and fortune, and that was show business, the entertainment industry. So it's getting offers to be, to be an actor. And so finally I thought, hmm, this is uh, easier. I'd be more famous, uh, easier money. So I, I accepted, and I became a TV star. And uh, at that time, I was only 25, and life was very good. Money was very easy. I was getting more popular. 
I, I was really enjoying my life, but the problem was every time I'm alone, I still felt this emptiness inside me. There's still something wrong. And so what I did was I filled my life with more frenetic activity. I did a lot of things, awful things. I was driving a Porsche. I was living in a Porsche condo. I was uh, dating and sleeping with models and celebrities. But uh, still something was wrong until I got into drugs, uh, drug ecstasy. And that's the drug, the drug that really got me because it really lives up to its name. I had a lot of issues. Um, and so by taking ecstasy, I thought, oh, for, for $20 a day, I could be more self-confident, you know. So I borrowed an identity from drugs and I would take drugs every morning and evening for many years, for many years. <laughs> but there are other stuff that I, I did that uh, was really disgusting too. And one of those was uh, I started also videotaping um, some of my sexual escapades. <clears throat> so that was me before I met Christ. I was uh, self-centered, I was very hedonistic, but I was also broken and I was really lonely. And so in December 2008, after my best friend's girlfriend confessed to my best friend that we were having an affair, my best friends conspired to destroy me and cut my legs from under me. So what they did was, uh, while one person invited me to a dinner, the other two went to my, my apartment and got everything they could get. Um, computers, laptops, cameras, memory cards, whatever they could get to find some evidence so that they could release this to the public and show also my girlfriend. They just really wanted to destroy me and teach me a lesson. They, they didn't know what they were going to find, but I knew. And I also knew that if this ever comes out, that's going to be the end of me. So I was so completely terrified. So what I did was uh, I went to, I write my own um, prescription. I went to the drugstore. I bought uh, 30 pieces of that sedative volumes. And I downed everything. Sent out my, my, uh, my goodbye messages. And then, and then I waited for me to die. But, but instead, I woke up three days from a coma. And uh, I descended into the psychiatric ward and seated beside me was my father. <laughs> and I found myself trapped in the psychiatric ward um, in the same hospital where I was just two years before the president of the intern. So everyone there knew me. So it made the whole ordeal more humiliating. <clears throat> but as, uh, So after several weeks of detoxification, I was finally allowed to go home. That was Christmas time in a... 2009 so they allowed me to spend Christmas with my family and every day at that time was a was really a struggle because my body was really still looking for the drugs so I fought really hard until in May 2009 someone a stranger called me asking for a hundred thousand dollars for me to pay otherwise they would release the videos so for me of course there was no way to, to find out if there, was, there were no other copies, so, so I didn't acquiesce to their demands. So on my own birthday, May 20, 2009, they released the videos. Every week they would release one video. So the, vid the videos immediately went viral, of course, as expected, and everyone was really feasting on it. It started appearing online and then in street DVDs. It became the banner headline in all the major newspapers, CNN, ranked it the number one Asia scandal, celebrity scandal in Asia. Uh, this morning I was just looking at it. I was trying to recall the feelings that I had. I was looking at all the, uh, the headlines, that, uh, all the things that they said about me. I was the most hated man in the Philippines at that time. Um, I was banned from going to several provinces.